Good afternoon. I'm standing between you and lunch. I realize that, so I will try to make this short. Feeding, the, talking about food, feeding the world is a complex problem. Um, and in fact, I have heard to refer to the system very often, the, uh, often as being broken, a broken system of food production, which is kind of interesting. But you can understand that. On the one hand, we are overconsuming on this part of the in this part of the world. On the other hand, 800 million people are still undernourished. So how can you consider that a a interesting and good system? But calling it broken implies that at some point it was okay. It was an okay system. And in many ways, our food production system right now is much, much better than it had ever been in the past. We're producing much more food with actually less resources than we ever had before. And if we would find a solution to distribute waste, this conference is already contributing to that, um, re redistribute waste, we actually would have solved some of those problems. We are going to two billion people with increasingly sophisticated uh, appetites for food. Some of them are really, really resource intense. Um, and we can probably no longer keep on doing business as usual. So is there a, a way of sort of thinking about this exponentially? Food seems to be very conventional. Can you, for instance, digitize food? Yes, you can, of course. It's not really in zeros and ones, but in all the molecules that it contains. We are, as human beings, are basically a bag of chemical reactions. And um, we have to build and regenerate our system by using sugars, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, all those chemicals that we ingest through our food. And of course, we can ingest the chemicals directly, and then you digitize the food. There are two reasons not to do that. One is Kosciuszko di Parma, uh, and the other is and of course I'm saying thank you. And of course I'm saying that because I'm in Italy. Um, the, um, but in truth, there are ways. To, there are reasons uh, why you shouldn't do that. Um, the other uh, thing is deception. Uh, we tend to think of agriculture as a low-tech system, and it's not. It's actually the area where robotization, big data, um, are are sort of pioneer. Um, it's a highly, highly technological system. And we tend to repress that idea because we don't want, because we ingest food and we don't like the idea of ingesting technology. Right? We are biologically programmed not to ingest things that we don't see as regular foods. <coughs> can it be disrupted? Yes, it can, and I will show an example of uh, cellular agriculture, and there are many examples, this is just one of them. Um, can you demonetize? And in fact, you, you can, into, into, uh, to certain degrees. Uh, if you have a vegetable garden and you share your uh, produce with neighbors, you're basically sharing and you're demonetizing. And you're actually also um, uh, democratizing food production. Can you dematerialize? No, you cannot. I, I don't see a way how you can dematerialized food. It will always be a material. Can you democratize? Yes, everybody can be a food producer. And we know that from vegetable gardens, but can we also do that for more difficult systems? Like, can we create animal proteins in our homes? Uh, can we create milk? Can we, can, can we create meat? Um, can we create cheese uh, from scratch? So when I think about Italy, uh, this is sort of the uh, romantic image that I have of Italy. Um, and this has everything. It has companionship, it has good food, it has uh, outdoors, it has um, good um, uh, laughter, it has everything. And wouldn't it be wonderful if in the future, even with any technology that we have, we could retain this? That would be kind of an interesting uh, prospect, I think. 
food is going to be, is, it has always been, and will continue to be a good excuse to socialize. So, if that's the image of Italy, this is the image of California. Um, and no bad words about California, but uh, nerds in California have come up with Soylent, which is basically a completely deconstructed food. Um, five bottles of liquid has all the nutrients, has all the sugars, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, everything that you need. Come, comes in four flavors, um, and you can just keep on typing on your computer and working, well, and you don't have to socialize um, while getting all the ingredients. We have a choice. We can choose one or the other, or any other variations in between. And consumer choice is something that is extremely powerful in directing the way we are moving forward. So my problem is that I love meat. And meat is an incredibly resource-intense product. For a quarter pounder of hamburger, uh, you need about eight pounds of grain. Uh, which you can also eat, uh, about nine square meters of land, just for one hamburger, uh, 1,200 liters of fresh water, and enough power to power your microwave for about 10 minutes. So it's incredibly resource-intense uh, material. Yet, it's highly popular. And you've seen on that table uh, in, the, uh, in the yard that there was a piece of uh, ham there. Um, it is very, very cherished. So can we do something about this? Is this going to be sustainable? It's actually not. Um, currently, we're using 70% of all our animal land for livestock meat production. Um, and according to the FAO, in 2050, so 35 years from now, you have heard that this is not too far away, meat consumption globally will be increased by 70%. Why is that? It's not because you and I are going to eat more meat, but it's because it's associated with wealth. And uh, in India and China, and at some point Africa, people become wealthier and they start to eat meat. It's happening right now, and according to the FAO, it will continue at least until 2050, 70% increase. There's no way we can produce that with business as usual. So, in 2004, I met this guy called Willem van Eden. He was a, uh, at that time he was already 86, um, and he was a, an entrepreneur and had galleries and restaurants. But he was obsessed most of his life with the idea of growing meat in a different way, using cell culture and tissue engineering to grow meat. And I got acquainted with that, and we got a project granted from the Dutch government to actually make this uh, happen. And the idea is very simple. You take a small piece of muscle from a cow, cow moves on, um, it's one centimeter long, one millimeter in diameter, it has a couple of hundred of these stem cells. And the stem cells that are sitting there are in every muscle, also in your muscle. If you rupture your muscle in an accident, uh, these guys come in, they start to divide, and they make muscle tissue. They replace the broken muscle with a new muscle tissue. It's a wonderful system. So it's not scar, it's functional muscle. These cells can do that, they have the capacity to do that, and they have not only the capacity to do that inside of the body, they can also do that outside of the body. So what we do is we take this small sample, let those cells grow out, let them expand, so we have trillions and trillions of these cells, they have a tremendous replicative capacity. Um, and then we coerce them to make meat, and the first step and that is then they need to sort of merge um, so that they form a primitive muscle fiber. And the instruction for them is very simple. We basically starve them and then they start to uh, grow together. And the second thing, of course, is that they need to perform labor. You all know that muscle needs to perform labor to become thick. And, and thick means protein-rich, and protein-rich means tasty. So <clears throat> how do we do that? Well, interestingly, our, our muscle cells are exercise junkies. You wouldn't say that of our, our sedentary people, uh, because our brains are not. Our brains are lazy, but our muscles are not. And these cells are not connected to a brain, so they start to contract. 
And if you place them in a certain condition, um, in a ring structure, as is displayed here, and in a gel, they actually form automatically a tissue. And when they start to contract, they develop tension. And that tension, as you know, if you've been to the gym, creates a thicker muscle, a protein-rich muscle. They do that for about three weeks. We don't do anything, we just keep them alive. Um, and then you basically have muscle fibers, very similar to a muscle that you get from, uh, a steak that you get from the supermarket. So this, we did this in 2013, and we decided, very unusual for uh, somebody like me, to stage a, to present this to the world in a hybrid between a cooking show and a press conference. So this is a small uh, video of that. We presented that hamburger. You've seen it already in the picture by uh, Eric. It was cooked by a very courageous chef because this hamburger cost 250,000 euro. Um, it was eaten by two food critics. <coughs> and they said, well, yeah, this is a hamburger. No big deal. Um, it was a little bit dry. There was no fat tissue. It was not, and it was not also really a product launch, if you like. It was just showing to the world, guys, this is possible. And we also should rethink the way we produce meat in the future. So that's nice that you have a um, proof of concept, but how do you create a solution for the problem for meat production? Because a 250,000 euro hamburger, of course, is not. Um, so fortunately, by doing this in cell culture, we can work on those cell culture conditions and uh, we can improve them, we can work on self-selection. There's a lot of variables that we can actually play with to make it an efficient system. So I'm, I'm not going into all the details of the science behind this, but um, um, of course to make it efficient, you have to be able to scale it, to scale production. Um, and cell culture in and by itself is not very scalable, um, but nowadays there are systems and this is just an example of them, where you grow the cells on microcarriers, the little pink balls, and the blue dots are the cells. They grow on those microcarriers, and the microcarriers are suspended in a big, in a big tank, in a fluid. So we can do this in 25,000 liter tanks, creating um, as much meat to feed about 10,000 Europeans for a year, about 5,000 Americans. Um, and that way you can scale and make it an efficient uh, process. So you go from very small scale on the far left here to very large scale on the far right into 25,000 uh, liters. So in that, in that sense, it is um, scalable. It also needs to be sustainable, which is very important for me. Um, the, the environmental impact of meat production is tremendous. 50 to 20% of all the greenhouse gas emission comes from livestock meat production. Um, so we want to do something about that as well. One of the things with uh, cell culture is that you use serum, which is a blood-derived product from cows, so we had to get rid of that. Um, the other is that gel in which those cells are sitting when they're sitting in that ring, we had to get rid of that as well. Um, and since it's a contained system in a tank, you can actually start to recycle pretty much everything that you are using. So this is a boring slide, it's basically to imprint on you, uh, because there's a lot to talk about this, that we actually grow these cells in the absence of serum, there's no serum uh, necessary for the cells, and they actually grow better in the absence of serum, and they also grow better in the absence of antibiotics. So no antibiotics, no serum. Um, we're also producing uh, fat tissue, because that hamburger was a little bit dry, so we wanted to improve it, and uh, that, of course, adds to the, the juiciness and the taste. Um, so we wanted to create fat tissue. We are doing that right now, so that the next version, the version 2.0, if you like, will have uh, fat tissue, and we're using basically fatty acids to stimulate those cells, those same cells, to become uh, fat. And then, um, at that, event in London, something interesting happened because the, the regular press said, yuck. Kind of an emotional response against 
this technology, if you like. And I was extremely frustrated by that because I, not, not because of the yuck or because of the emotional response, but because I couldn't quite figure out what was behind it. Um, so gradually we started to think about this, and this was one of my dilemmas. Um, who of you have ever eaten, who of you have ever eaten a hot dog? Quite a few. Do you know what's in it? No? Do you want to know? No? That's the response that I usually get. People don't want to know what's in it. So we are perfectly capable of eating stuff that we don't actually know what's in it or how it's been made. So how is that different for a hamburger? Well, I think a lot of this has to do with uh, safety. Again, we are a species biologically programmed not to eat things that we don't know. If you go into a forest and, and you are not a connoisseur and you pick mushrooms and you sort of randomly start to eat those mushrooms, chances are that you're going to poison yourself. Right? So we, we don't do those things. And by now, a lot of people have eaten hot dogs um, and they all stay alive. Right? Surprisingly. Um, and that means that you gradually develop trust in a food like this. Um, and, and so the idea of safety is really important. There are a couple of other things I don't have time to go, uh, to go into it. Uh, but of course it's also a cultural value. Meat is something very masculine. Barbecues, uh, hunting, uh, all that sort of stuff. So it's also a very cultural concept. And when you make that into something that is made without any danger in a factory, it becomes sort of a wimpy version of meat, right? Okay, so um, we actually did a survey, or a, a study I should say, the first psychological study that I've ever did in my life, in, in the south of the Netherlands, where we basically asked the question, what type of information do we need to give people um, to increase their acceptance? What type of information are people looking for? And marketeers have ideas about this, uh, but there's actually not really a lot of research around this. So we basically took a group of 193 people, we divided them in three groups, one got information about, well, this is better for society eventually, one got information, this is better for you, we can make this product healthier if you like, we can make those fatty acids in the fat tissue omega-3 fatty acids so that it lowers your cholesterol. Uh, and the third group got basically information, this is just high quality meat, that's it. And then, because the study was co-organized by a student of mine from a sensory analysis master in Dijon, uh, we wanted to let people taste a hamburger and a hamburger that was labeled as culture. Uh, and ask them questions, you know, how, how do you feel about this, how, do you, how does it look, how does it taste, and things like that. Uh, this is a very busy slide. Um, we basically asked four questions. Um, are you in favor of this technology? Do you want to taste it? Do you want to buy it if it's available? Do you want to replace your current meat consumption uh, by cultured meat consumption? And we asked the information before we gave, we asked the questions before we gave information, after information, and after tasting. Um, and of course, the, the, the three different colors are the different uh, information groups. And what, at first glance, you already notice is that there's not a big difference between those information groups. They're all pretty much the same. So tell, telling us that no matter what type of information you give, that really doesn't matter that much. What is also noticeable, if you go through those four, is that information in itself, no matter what type of information, everything increases acceptance. So people are information hunger, uh, hungry. Um, and the other thing was, which was kind of counterintuitive for me, um, is that Baseline, and this is in the Netherlands, like 50% thought this was a great idea uh, and about 50% would want to buy it and replace it. This is, by the way, no indication of what people are going to do in a supermarket, uh, but it's still some idea of how they think about it rationally. Interestingly, taste, even before um, any information was given, 90% of the people wanted to taste this. So people are really curious, and apparently they think, in terms of safety, not this is going to kill me immediately, this is just going to kill me over a couple of years. <laughs> so we have become, um, also um, uh, with a couple of other surveys, we have become reasonably confident 
that once this product is on the market, oh, by the way, I should tell you, 193 people participated in the study. They all ate that piece that was cultured. And they all, and, and actually the cultured piece was just labeled cultured. It was a, a regular piece of hamburger, actually cut from the same hamburger as the conventional hamburger. You, in psychological studies, you can fool people, I found out, um, as long as you disclose it afterwards. So they were exactly the same, but they found the cultured one actually better tasting than the conventional one which is also something that we know from um, other foods, I guess. So what about the price? Can we actually reduce that price? It was already alluded to, so originally that hamburger was $330,000, and if we make it right now with that scaled up version, it's around $11 per, per hamburger, which is still a lot. Um, can we go from that price point to a lower price point? We have done a lot of calculations and a lot of studies um, to show that this actually can be uh, reached. And in our minds, eventually it will reach a price point below that of regular meat. Because the conversion ratio, which it means how much food goes in it and how much meat do you get out of it, which for an, which for an animal, especially a cow, is really abysmal. It's like 15% we get out of that cow. Um, if you were to design a protein-producing system right now to feed the world, you would never, ever come up with a cow, right? It's just not very efficient. So if you improve that food conversion ratio, you in inevitably are going to reduce the price to a, a regular price. So up to two years ago, this is kind of interesting, up to two years ago, I was the only one in the world doing this, which kind of feels lonely after a while. I think, well, maybe, Maybe I'm wrong, um, but uh, this slide has to be updated pretty much every couple of weeks. Um, so this is a very busy slide. Um, I just want to focus on clean protein. This is not only meat, this is also chicken, also fish, also milk. Um, and there are now 27 companies. Just in the last couple of months, the number of companies is kind of exponentially rising. Companies uh, doing this. Um, and equally interesting is that in terms of uh, funding, it comes from large meat companies like Bell, like Cargill, like Tyson, and also from large uh, venture capital uh, firms like uh, Merck Ventures, uh, New World Capital, um, and uh, Blue Horizon, uh, but also uh, Richard Branson, earlier named Bill Gates. So a lot of people start to invest in this, a lot of money is um, pouring into this, and uh, in my mind, that's sort of a confirmation that this is going to happen. This is going to be a novel food um, in Europe. That means that you have to go through a safety uh, regulation, so we have to prove that this is absolutely safe. Um, and I want to prove, of course, that it is absolutely safe. As a consumer, I would like that, so we all need to have that. And also, if EFSA eventually deems this to be safe, then we should all be com confident that it actually is safe. So that, that is just regulation, it takes a while, it takes money, it takes patience, um, but we are quite confident that we will get there. And then this futuristic picture, this really futuristic picture, all of a sudden is still possible. Um, and this will allow us still the choice to eat whatever we want without the negative consequences on environment, animals, and, and food security. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and have a nice lunch.